Hi there. Welcome to the Sober Circle channel. Enjoy this speaker tape. Will you please join me in the serenity prayer? God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Tonight, our illustrious 40-minute speaker is hailing from Studio City, and her name is Katie. And uh, come on over. Right, there it is. Wow, I like that you guys have two microphones. It's a little dirty in a church, isn't it? <laughs> if one is good. Um, <clears throat> hi, my name is Katie. I'm an alcoholic. I feel like I should be like driving a tractor or something. Um, anyway, uh, my name is Katie. I'm an alcoholic. I did that already. Uh, thank you for having me. This is so fun. It's a church. It's real churchy in here, you guys. Um, which is nice. It's a good thing. I celebrated um, 12 years sober uh, this past October. Thanks. Um, uh, since we're in a church, and since it's my favorite topic, I'm, I'm sort of moved tonight uh, to, talk, to talk about my spiritual journey. Um, I, don't, I don't really know how you talk about AA and being sober without talking about your spiritual journey, since it's a spiritual program. Um, but I can definitely say for myself, this, this thing is um, entirely a spiritual program. I used to think when I first came in, um, it was like a therapy program, or if it was like about uh, therapy. And I, then I learned that it wasn't for me. Therapy is important. Uh, I think we should all do it. Um, but it's, the 12 steps are a spiritual program. And my, um, my personal journey is a profoundly spiritual one. So um, when I got here, I was an atheist, a strong one, big time believer in the atheism. My dad, I was raised by um, cerebral, uh, uh, empiricist, atheist, CEO, PhD, smart guy dad, who, yes, smart guy dad, not so warm and fuzzy, but super smart guy, very um, atheist, atheist, atheist. Anything spiritual makes you a loser, makes you weak and wimpy. If you have crutches, you're dumb. You're dumb. If you're spiritual, you're dumb, is what I was taught. And I was taught that from, like, 100%. That's what's true. That's the law. I remember when I was in treatment, they said, um, most of you in here, if you're in treatment, you, you believe that there's, uh, there's two ways of doing life. There's dad's way and the wrong way. And that was true for me. I was raised like my dad was the alcoholic. What he said went. It was truth. It was fact. He was my higher power, so on and so forth. So then uh, my mom was a lapsed Catholic. She was raised, uh, born and raised Catholic and uh, had a hard time with it, as many people do, and then uh, just decided to not be doing that anymore when she got married to my dad and kind of just abandoned her faith a little bit. And uh, not a little bit, entirely, 100%. And so we just lived in a house that was anti-God, is my point. So um, I was always a, bye. <laughs> Have a good night. Okay, Thank yeah. you so much. It'll be funny later. <laughs> okay, very good, very good. <laughs> so um, <sighs> so um, the guys at dinner, I went, these people are so nice, of all these people here. They had me for dinner, and they said, come do the meeting, and we'll feed you also. And I was like, that's super generous. And they did that, and they were nice to me. And then we were walking out here, and they were like, so you're going to be funny at the meeting, right? You're going to be funny? <laughs> I'm like, I'm off the clock, fuckers. <laughs> this is my fucking serious time. Anyway. <laughs> uh, so, no God. God was dumb. And I came here, and, uh, and uh, that's what I believed. And, oh, but what I was going to tell you was that as a kid, I was always very um, interested in the paranormal and the spiritual, and I used to do weird things, imaginal things, and I used to have um, lots of time alone in my room, dark room with uh, the glow-in-the-dark stars that I had on the ceiling, and I would listen to Metallica and um, Led Zeppelin. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> and I would listen to those guys and I would have what I now understand was spiritual experiences I didn't understand it at the time but I would sort of experience myself feeling very light and expanding and feeling like I was one with all things and 
I remember I dated this alcoholic kid when I was 16, big surprise, and he was a drug dealer, and I was like the smart girl getting straight A's who partied with the drug dealer kids, because I like to do both, I like to work hard, play hard, that's how I did things. And also, like, I like to, I was like super chameleon style, I like to impress the smart kids and be the smartest one, and then be like, fuck those smart kids, I'm going with the cool guys. And then go with the cool guys and be like, and feel superior to the cool guys, because I was really pretty fucking smart. You know what I mean? So I had, I was like better than everybody, which was nice. Um, and so, uh, um, oh, so I remember talking to, when I was 16, I remember having this conversation with that boyfriend, the drug dealer one, who uh, was a drug dealer. Um, that's important to the story. And he, like a hardcore drug dealer, like serious, doing stuff up, taking all kinds of crap all day through high school. Like I saved up. I like to save up. I work hard in high school and then go get fucked up in the parking lot after high school. Now you don't do it in high school because you're busy. But this guy was, no, he was all the time, all the time. I got to all the time later, don't worry. So, but anyway, the point is, I remember we had a conversation on the phone one night and I said to him, I had had the Metallica on and the stars were there and I had had like an expansion-y, open -y experience and he called me and I was like, Jeff, it's so amazing. Like, I think, I think I understand what I'm supposed to do. I think I'm, I know what my life purpose is. It's like I can see how all people are just one energy force and one energy field and we're all interconnected and all of our, the connection happens through the heart. And I think my, I'm going to see myself in the future like at a podium, like talking to people and I'm talking about stuff and I'm talking about unity and oneness and I want to like serve and I want to like help people. You know what I mean? I think we could really like change the world. I feel like I'm supposed to help change the world. You know what I mean? And his response was, yeah, I just want to get high and eat pizza. <laughs> and I remember thinking, this is not um, the right guy for me to be dating. But, but I stayed with him for like three years after that because he had the drugs. Um, <clears throat> but so my point being, I was ex having spiritual experiences at a really young age, and they were legit. God was there, and this God thing that we talk about was talking to me and informing me and inspiring me and making me feel happy, joyous, and free. But I didn't understand it. I didn't have any context for it. And I thought, like, all... This is... I gotta make this like that. Okay. Dirty. Um, I thought... I thought... I'm not gonna say that. Okay, I thought that, um... The, that, that the... The context I had for my spiritual experiences was, like, from, um, acid trip books. And, like, acid trip comedians and acid trip stories like so I thought I equated spirituality with acid is what I'm trying to say and weed you know what I mean like you get fucked up and amazing shit happens you know that was my idea of what spirituality was because in my house it was not cool and it was not supportive so um my dad was an active alcoholic when I was a kid and I'm an only child and I was always very sensitive, very psychic, very intuitive, um, and those things were frowned upon. So I learned very early on how to shut it all down, stuff it down. My first love was sugar um, uh, any, and quantity, quantity of anything. Lots of food, lots of beverages, uh, you know, kid beverages, sugar. I had a, a, my first love addiction in second grade. My first little boyfriend love addiction. I mean, serious, hardcore, like Danny Caballero. Danny Caballero, he was the hot second grader, and I, I determined, I made my mind up, I would have him. I didn't know what have meant, but I was going to have him. And I, I mean, truly, it's a, it's a sort of funny, but it's a sad state of affairs. I already had that, the ism of, I'm uncomfortable in my skin, I don't really know how to be here, so I'm going to fixate on something outside myself, need it, acquire it or desperately attempt to acquire it, and then my whole sense of am I okay revolves around whether or not I acquire it. And then acquiring it and being like, what do I do now? And then I acquire something new. You know, that was happening for me at eight years old. Um, I learned how to dissociate out of my body really, really young. Um, some of that is because, uh, this is part of my story, and we're gonna get real depressed. I, uh, I did experience um, some sexual abuse as a very young person, uh, as an infant and as a three-year-old. And I won't get too into it, but I'll tell you that that kind of trauma for a young person 
uh, creates a pattern of dissociation. You just leave the body because your, your little two-year-old brain just can't hang. So you just, psh, you're out. So then the rest of my life became, and I have the gene, the alcoholism gene, which is a fun combo. And so then the rest of my life became about how do I get out of this skin, up and out, just in any way possible. So um, I think I, I tried to get Danny Caballero, and I couldn't get him, so I got Dax Gallegos instead. And he was like my runner-up guy. And uh, I got him. I got him. And then this is what I did to Dax Gallegos in second grade. Um, I'm telling you, this is, this is my history. This is just a little background leading to the... I mean, the thing was at play way back in the beginning. Um, I got, you know, I'll just tell you the story. I got Dax Gallegos to be my boyfriend. And I didn't know what that meant, but I was going to make it happen. I made it happen. And the moment he agreed, I had a dream one night that he did something to me that scared me. I don't remember the dream. It was vague. It was hazy. I don't know what it was. So I woke up in the morning, a second grader, and I decided to ruin his life. Yeah. And I did. I succeeded. What I did was, I, it's, ter- it's a terrible, sad, sad story of, like a, of a sad little girl who was in a lot of pain and who was looking for a way to like, make the pain be outside of herself. You know, If I could cause it to him, maybe I didn't have to have it in me. Um, so I got everybody in the after-school care program that we went to together to call this kid a name. That would, and I picked a name that I knew would be really hurtful and would make him feel really isolated and alone. And we called him It, I-T. And I don't know where I got that, but it was mean, and it, it really hurt this kid. And I knew he was sensitive. I knew just what button to push in second grade to hurt this guy's heart. And we did that for six months. I isolated this kid. I ostracized him. I called him It. I mean, he was in torment. Until so one day, I remember all the um, after-school care counselors sat us down at this table, and they were like, so Katie, it was him and me and the counselors, and they were like, so Katie, what's up with this name-calling thing? Like, we hear you're calling Dax it. And I, I can tell you guys that above all else, I, rem- I remember sitting in my little plastic chair in the cafeteria, like leaning back in it, like inside myself thinking like, all right, yeah, I'll say what you fuckers want me to say. Okay, what, 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 what do you want me to say? Oh, right, yeah, sure, I'll stop. Cool. But inside, it was like hate and rage, and I'm going to do whatever I fucking want to do, is what I'm going to do. So go ahead, okay, I'll make nice, and I'll say what you, oh, sure, we, we'll stop with Dax. We'll, we'll treat little Daxy nice. But I wasn't going <laughs> to. Issues. So I was, I was eight. I was eight. That's some dark, that's some, that's not... Fun. So I did that, and that's 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 the beginning of it. Um, from there, <laughs> uh, it it just proceeded that way until I got sober. Essentially, um, I can kind of lump it all together and say I spent my childhood and my teenage years and my very early twenties trying to make the pain in my heart get out of my heart by drinking smoking, putting things on my tongue, eating, sleeping with, dancing with, fucking, you know, whatevering, (laughs) driving things fast, high up, fall down, caffeine, parties, whatever I could do to make the pain and the rage and the anger and the shame in my heart feel like it wasn't there anymore. And and one of my favorite tools at that time was to put it at you, like make you hurt so maybe I would hurt a little bit less. Um... Another fun example of that is just before I got sober, and I'll get there real quick. Um, At the end of my college experience, so I went away to um, give you a picture. I I spoke at my high school graduation, and I spoke at my college graduation. I've always been kind of a speaker kind of person. And uh, I did well. I got the grades you're supposed to get. Um, but I'll t- and 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 I, I like to name drop with this particular story because I think it makes a point. At my college graduation, Bill Cosby spoke, and me, and I was fucking high. <laughs> I was so fucking high. And Bill Cosby's there, and the deans, and the president, and my parents had gotten divorced the summer before, 
and they were in the building together for the first time since the divorce, like four years later, and that was happening, but it was like way over there behind a thick haze. And I did well, man, because that's my thing, is I can perform well. I can put the show on. If the show has to go on, I can put the fucking show on. But nobody in the room or the building or the field or wherever we were knew that inside I, I had this, I used to describe it like a, this triangle that was from the base of my throat down to my pelvis. And it was, the tip of it was here, and it would go out like that triangle. And um, <laughs> this is a triangle. Um, and it was a, a triangle of, like, thick, black, hate, rage, anger combo. It felt like tar. I had, like, a tar triangle that moved through the center of me. Um, and, but at the same time, there I am getting the grades, speaking at the graduation, famous people, money. I got big, impressive looking jobs right out of college, blah, 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 hate triangle inside, real thick and dense. Um, so that's how it's been for me is that dichotomy, that play back and forth between nobody really knows what's going on and I'm dying inside. That's my story. Over and over and over, I have 100,000 stories like that. So, um, another fun example, my best friend from childhood uh, was a girl named Tracy Raffle. We met in sixth grade. We were instant best friends. We were together all the time. And uh, she, was the, she felt like more my family than my family did. You know, like family of origin was real toxic. I didn't like going home. I always felt uh, like an alien in my home. I felt unsafe in my home. Mom was going to get rageful about something every day. That was just how it was going to go down. And Dad was going to isolate and go up into his office and drink until he was done with the day. And nobody was, like, hanging out with Katie, you know, because they were busy doing their thing. And this is, this is, I mean, God bless them and I forgive them, but this is the picture. This is what was occurring. Uh, so Tracy was my family, essentially. And we grew up together. We were together uh, from sixth grade all the way through um, high school. And in the last year of high school, we went, to, we went to two different high schools. And she, I had 100 million boyfriends, because I was a whore. And she, I mean, I was social and outgoing. Um, she, so I don't really mean, that sounds very mean. I wasn't a whore. But I had whore-like patterns. <laughs> Tracy, on the other hand, was like a nice girl who didn't date boys. She was a little nerdy, a little smart, didn't date any boys, didn't know how to do it. She'd get, well, how do you do it? Flirting, what does it mean? And she'd be like, how do you flirt? And I'd be like, what do you mean, how do you flirt? You just do. I just, yeah, I don't know. But she didn't have that thing in her. Like, a lot of 11-year-olds don't, you know? <laughs> so, so... So Tracy makes it all the way to senior year of high school, no boyfriends, not even a, a blink of no nothing, no recognition from the loser drug dealer guy, no football play people, nothing, nothing's going on for Tracy. Finally, she, gets, she finds this other circle of friends that has nothing to do with me, which already is a problem over here. I'm not cool with Tracy having other people, first of all. She needs to be like super codependently enmeshed to me and only me because I was my family and that's all I had so fear and you know <clears throat> make it stay she gets these other friends one of them is this guy Judd and Judd has a crush on Tracy which fucked me up in a big way um, because I knew he was a threat and he might take her hello somebody's phone is it for me no I think it might be up here He's like, I'm just gonna let it ring. Okay. Cool. Uh, so uh, I did that just because I'd be like staring at you. The whole, I couldn't even say words, and I'd be like, oh, pretty noisy. There it is. So um, she gets this this guy, and they're not even together, but he likes her, and I know he likes her. So my. Underneath my behavior, what I felt was, I ha was, when I looked back at it, having done amends on it, you know, I was just terrified that I was going to lose my best friend. But all I felt in the moment, on the front of my heart, was, uh, must destroy this. 
Oh. Must destroy. So I, what I did was, it's a bad, it's a bad one, is I, uh, I didn't like Judd at all, but I, I made a point, I, I became 100% driven to make him want me more. I needed him to want me more. So I made that happen. I wasn't even interested in the guy. Stole him from her. Uh, went to college. Had him, somehow manipulated him to come visit me at college. We got together one time. And at the end of it, I just remember immediately like this cloud of, of, of just grief and shame and guilt just descending over me. Because this, was, this woman, this Tracy, was... She was the only love I knew. She was my best friend. She was my only real family. And I had just 100% thrown her under the bus. Just 100% betrayed anything that was ever good between us. I ended up calling her and calling myself out on it. I told her everything. She, and she uh, left the friendship for, I think it was like eight years. We weren't friends. Um, in sobriety, I was able to make really great amends with her, and thank God, today we're super buds again. But that was an eight-year period of, of me having to live with, I lost my sister, my only family, you know, because I, I, I couldn't live with her having something that I couldn't have. So that was my pattern, that's what I did. Meanwhile, of course, I should say, hey, I mean, talk about the things. I was drinking a lot and doing a lot of drugs, and that, I feel like that's sort of the obvious part. I'm telling you guys, like, the real stuff behind the things. So I, I had my first drink at 14 with Tracy. We put a bunch of drinks in a thing. It turned green. We drank it. We got hammered. And I pursued that experience like a crazy lunatic person until the day I stopped drinking. She put the drinks in the thing. It got dr- green, drank it, had a crazy time, and then didn't drink again until college. And then got drunk a couple times in college and, like, called me up and was like, this is crazy. It's like I can't feel my face. <laughs> and, and, like, I remember one night she called me and she was like, you know, Katie, I'm just done. Because we went out and we got so drunk and I lost my shoe. <laughs> Can you believe that? I lost my shoe. I'm so done. And she was done. That was the consequence she needed. She lost a shoe <laughs> in winter in Chicago, and that was fucking enough. And I was like, and I remember thinking at the time, like, what a fucking loser my best friend is. She cannot hang, you know? What the fuck? Cause she is, I don't know. I didn't get it at all. But I, but I certainly judged it, and I thought it was lame. So... She, you know, she went on to, like, graduate and make a hundred grand right out of college, get married, house, fence, two dogs. She's still doing that. It's all good. It's been pretty linear, pretty healthy, pretty normal, pretty great. But I was cool. <laughs> so, uh, so, so, I, we, uh, this is scary. So, we're in college, and I, I get through the college. I'm doing a lot of the drugs. I'm drinking all the time. I'm, I'm a definite binge eater, definite serious uh, uh, eating disorder uh, that had set in when I was about 15. That progressed really intensely all the way through uh, college. Um, graduate from college, moved to New York City. Uh, I've, I've been a performer my whole life, and so, of course, you, you leave. I went to college in Massachusetts, so I went to New York City to do the acting thing. And I had zero life skills. Like, I, ha- I was good at, I've been, I have the brain thing, like I could write good papers, but that doesn't teach you shit all about surviving in Manhattan. Like, I didn't know anything. And like, money, when I was a kid, they would just like give it to me and then give me guilt about it. They'd be like, here's lots and lots of money, but you're terrible with money! And I'd be like, okay, as long as I have a lot of it, it's good. And that's all I knew. <laughs> and then I go to Manhattan and I'm like, I'm gonna take this town over. <laughs> I don't know how I was doing. We get to Manhattan, and I'm drinking a whole lot of alcohol, a whole lot of alcohol. Um, right before I got sober, I, there was this Tuesday that I always remember, because it talks about it in one of our books. It, it talks about alcoholics have moments of clarity, right? And I, uh, there was a Tuesday. I was working at the Late Show with David Letterman, and I would get drunk in the morning and go to McDonald's before work, binge on a McDonald's meal, 
and usually take a break around 11 or noon to go binge again at the McDonald's downstairs, because then my drunk will be wearing off a little bit, smoke some cigarettes. I mean, the whole day was about managing my state and about managing my high and about managing my, like, could I stay full enough to keep my feelings at bay and could I stay drunk enough to, like, just be, like, fucking rocking out, like, was the combo I was looking for. So it was a Tuesday morning, and my friend who I lived in a one-room studio with on the Upper East Side, we shared a bed, she and I, because we were artists, and (laughs) we shared a bed, and uh, she, she, we got some donuts. We got a 24-pack of donuts, the Krispy Kreme 24, best thing you can put in your mouth on the earth, if you ask me. Got them, and she ate two of them, and before I knew it, the box was empty, which meant I had eaten 22 donuts in the morning. And then I started pounding shots, and this was, we were about to get in a cab to go to fucking work. It it wasn't eight yet. It wasn't eight in the morning. And you know how much sugar that is, 22 donuts? That's like, you're already so, like, like, I would hallucinate. I would eat so much sugar, I would see things. It was... Fucked up. So we get in this cab, and I have what I now understand was my first moment of clarity. And I turned to my friend, her name was Courtney, and I said, I was like looking out the window, I remember, and I had, a, I had this, just this, it hit me. I turned to her and I go, I go, you know what, Courtney, I just have a, I have a sense about this. I have a feeling, call me crazy, but I have a feeling if I could just like get this whole alcohol, men, food thing down, everything else would just fall right into place. Boom. (laughs) Like, I fucking saw the light, you know what I mean? Like, I knew, I was like, I got this shit. This is life, simple. Men, food, alcohol, put it down, good. Everything's good. And I just, boom, that was it. And I was very, it was like a fucking, it was the tunnel was open and God spoke, you know what I mean? And I said it to her, and I, I imagined in my mind that she would respond in kind. That she would be like, fucking totally, I've been thinking that, I'm with you, yes. But she didn't. She looked at me like I had three heads, because she had had two donuts, like a normal person would. She had two donuts, and I realized later, when I got sober, all those mornings we were partying together before work, she didn't have any alcohol. I had the alcohol. I thought we were partying. We were not partying. She was thinking, you're a fucking mess. <laughs> but you're kind of entertaining, so I'll hang out, you know? Um, so, and I, I, honestly, I didn't know. We lived together for like a year and a half. I thought we partied every morning. We did not party. It was just me. So, um, I was in therapy at the time, and I go to my therapist. <laughs> Yeah, and I would go to my therapist every day, or every week, and I would, um, every day in the therapy, that's what I do now, um, no, but I would go to therapy, and I would go in there and talk to her about my writing projects, right, I'd go in and I'd be like, I'm fucking amazing, and I'm writing all this shit, and I'm going to be like a big wig in a big way, and I'd, and I'd talk to her for a full hour about how hard my writing was and how I was having trouble focusing. And these are legitimate things. I had some ADD issues and I, it's like a thing you could talk about in therapy. But I never, it never, I never once touched on any of this other shit that was going on until the moment of clarity day. And all of a sudden I found myself in her office saying to her, you know, this thing happened in the cab. And I like recounted it to her. And she sort of like sighed and like it was, she like relaxed a little bit. And like now I can look back and realize she did that thing that we do now with newly sober alcoholics who finally kind of get like, oh wait, I think I have a problem. And you go, yes, that was what she was doing. She looked at me like, okay, okay, okay. Listen, she said, there's a place you can go. And I didn't know about you guys. And she said, there's a place you can go called Alcoholics Anonymous. There's a really good meeting on the Upper East Side, 92nd Street Y. You can go. There's people there. There's a place for you. You're not crazy. There's a way out. You can do it. And I had no idea what I was getting into or what this meant or whatever. I had projects to do. I had things to write. So I didn't know. This all seemed like kind of like a sidebar to the real issue. 
But she said, go to this meeting. So I go to this meeting, and this African-American prostitute, crack addict, homeless woman spoke. And I have never in my life, up to that point, ever felt closer to another human being than I felt to that woman. Because she talked about um, the obsession of the mind, the allergy of the body, how she would wake up in the morning and think, today, I'm not going to have any alcohol, I'm just going to do a fucking day. And then by 11.30 in the morning, she'd be hammered and not understand how it had happened. And she'd talk about the fights she would have with her pimp, and they were the same fights I would have with my boyfriends. They were the same fights. We're having the same fights. Because it wasn't, it wasn't about was she a pimp, pimp, prostitute, Amherst College, white girl, nothing. It was about the insides. And she talked about um, feeling like an alien in her house. She talked about feeling unsafe in her own body. She talked about sexual abuse as a kid. This, she laid it out. And I never felt so fucking close to someone. And, I never, and then everybody was raising their hand and being like, you know, me too, and crying. And I, my dad never, we, there was no communication in our house. And people were just like being honest all around me. And I felt like I was in like heaven. I felt like this is what I've been waiting, this is what I've been looking for. I didn't even know I was looking for something, but this is what it is. Like, and I realized in that moment I had been craving all the time just someone I could be real with. I was so compulsive and performery and driven and like I'm funny and ba -da -ba -ba -da -ba, that like I didn't even I couldn't turn it off. I could never just be a person. You know what I mean? Um, and it was exhausting to live that way. It's a tiring way to live. But in these room, this room I was in with this woman who looked nothing like me, and everybody's raising their hand and everybody's being real. And I was like, wait, you can be real here. Shh, shh don't tell anyone. And I just felt like I'm, I'm coming here all the time. And I just that was it. I just came back all the time. I did what you guys said to do. I stopped drinking alcohol. I stopped smoking weed. Although that was a big one. That was a shift I had to go through. Um, the weed thing. Which is a fun story. But <laughs> the, the point being, the honesty and the vulnerability and the, the realness and the tears and the laughter about the tears. You know how we laugh about like big tragic shit. And Normie, like, I'm not, sometimes I bring my mom to meetings. This poor woman, we were talking about this on the way over. Like, she's just a well, nice little Catholic lady, just sitting in the meetings. And, and she's very looking at, oh. You know, people are sharing, and it's very, wow. And then, ha, 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 we're all laughing. And she's like, ha, 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 ha. Are we laughing at it with his pain? We're going to laugh. Okay, ha, 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 ha. You know, because it's. They don't, because we're crazy. So, anyway, so <laughs> I liked, I liked what you guys had here, and I, I jumped in, and I did what we're supposed to do. Um, the, the weed story, <laughs> eh, you guys know the weed story. I mean, the weed story is like, I was sober, but I was like, but I get fucking high, because <laughs> different thing. And then I had a friend in, in program say to me, because I, I remember I invited one of my AA friends, I like AA girlfriend that we talked on, the, we checked in all the time, checking in, just checking in, here's how I'm feeling. <laughs> and like, today I just noticed that like, I'm just, I felt, I was really angry at the cab that went by, and then I just was sad, I'm feeling sad. And then at the, <laughs> at the end of the conversation, I was, I, it was very open heart, feely, feely, and then at the end of it, I was like, Ah, so anyway, I've got this amazing weed. You have to come over tonight. Are you coming over when you fuck up? And she was like, um, so hey, you're in a 12-step program, and we don't do that. And I, was, and I didn't get it, and I was like, what do you mean we don't do that? She said, you don't, we don't, what we don't do is we don't alter our state with chemicals uh, to get high and not be present. Like, that's the whole thing you don't do with the sobriety. And it was a new idea. I was a few months in, and this was like, what? Like, I didn't, it, whatever. And here's the thing about me, though. The thing about me is, for better and worse, I have strong people-pleasing tendencies. And this was now, these are my only people now. Like, I had abandoned the bad people. You know, I was, this, whatever. I was, uh, you guys were it. So if you were not smoking weed, I better stop smoking weed because otherwise I can't come to your club and be at your parties. <laughs> and so I, I stopped. Um, and I always say that, um, I do always say that like when I got to about seven years sober, 
I woke up one day and I went, I haven't had any weed in seven years. That's insane. And it was like I literally, for the first time, understood that I was sober. Like it was almost like I dropped into my body and got on a deeper level that I had actually done this thing. Because I'm such a weed head. Like I love marijuana. I fucking love getting high. I love it. And I hadn't done it in seven years, but I didn't know I hadn't done it for seven years until one day. And then I went, what? And what? Because, I, because what I now understand is that my first seven years in sobriety, I just was like an AA robot person. I, just, I was 23. I was 23 when I came in here. And I had no parenting. I had no idea what, how to be a person at all. I knew how to be a smart ass and how to write a good paper and to make people laugh a little bit. But I didn't know anything else at all about anything. And so um, in my first seven years, I think I just came in and blindly you do the steps. I did the steps. You get a sponsor, I got a sponsor. You sponsor other people, I sponsored other people. You speak at meetings, I spoke at meetings. Um, but to tell you the truth, I didn't... There was a very deep... Um, remember we talked about the triangle of hate and rage and shame that was in me. It was still alive and well, and it was still very much what, kept, what held me up. My, my first few shows that I wrote and all the plays I was in in my first bunch of years in sobriety, they were all built on that triangle of hate and rage and shame. The characters I played were twisted, dark, angry people. The shows I wrote were, ah, fuck you, kind of shows. And... Um, that worked for me, and I needed them to be that. That's what they were at that time. And then I hit the wall at about six and a half, seven years sober. I hit a really serious wall. Now, some people hit it at ten, some people hit it at five, some people hit it at four. If you're lucky, you're one of those people who hits it. You're so fucked up when you come in, you're just fucking broken on all levels, and you just come in, and you're at the wall already. Like, I, I love those people. Like, some people just come in all kinds of ready. They're just fucking ready. They're broken and open, and they're like, I, teach me. I will weep. I will weep the tears of sorrow. I will grieve the pain of the... I was not that girl. Like, I came in here and, like, got straight A's in AA. I got straight A's. That's what you do. You get straight A's. I did it right, again, on the outside. I made it look good. I said the right words. I memorized the big book. And page 473 says, fucking buck. But I was like a... But I was fucking... I was messed up, you guys. I was not right. So at about six and a half, seven years... Um, I'm supposed to stop talking when? Okay, thank you. I, um, this is where it gets fun, um, or real, or deep, or some new level of something. I, I had the life I, I wanted, right? I, I had envisioned, I learned in sobriety, I did a lot of things. I did Landmark, I did a lot of therapy, I did fucking The Secret every day, four times a day, watching it on TV. Like, I'm going to have the fucking life. I, I didn't get sober to be depressed and broke. I'm going to be a fucking badass and take shit over. Then I learned all the uh, Tony Robbins and the shit. And I did all that. And I got really good at getting what I wanted, right? And so I, I was, I was um, in uh, Northern California. I was playing a lead role in a big musical show. My first solo show was touring. I was making a lot of money touring that show. Uh, I had, um, I was living in like a mansion in the hills for free that I had finagled through somebody who I knew from a thing. And uh, I had this kind of like amazing looking life once again. I had pretty much recreated my family of origin pattern. It all looked fucking good. America could applaud me and say, you're doing aces, Katie. You got a fucking straight A's in life. And I was dying inside, dying. And I had worked the effing steps, and I, had de I was meditating twice a day. Twice a day, I was doing transcendental meditation twice a day for six years, dying inside. Been to therapy, done a lot of stuff already, dying inside. Couldn't stop um, dating toxic men. Um, couldn't stop, couldn't stop, couldn't stop. Wanted to stop, couldn't stop. Went to some of those programs, couldn't do the programs. I was a mess. And I really wanted to get high, is what I wanted to do. I wanted to smoke some weed and just calm the fuck down. But I, by that time, I, was too, I had too much ego and pride invested in what we do here. I couldn't be that girl who went out. So, you know, fuck it. If your ego keeps you here, rock on. I don't, it doesn't matter. There's a saying in Overeaters Anonymous. They say, let your vanity lead to sanity. I like that. 
because I don't want to be 400 pounds, so I'm not going to eat seven cheeseburgers today. It's a pretty simple equation. And yeah, is, van, is there vanity in that? Yeah, but I'm not 400 pounds. Thank you, God. Because you know what I'm saying? So if your ego keeps fuck, I don't want to, I'm not going to get fucking drunk. It's good. Stay. You don't have to be Mother Teresa. Just stay. Anyway. <laughs> so, so, so there I am. And, uh, I'm, I, it's a mess. It's not good. And, uh, but I, and I would, the, the thing, the thing was, the meditation, I was pooping on it a second ago, but the truth of the matter is that it really saved me because even though my inside triangle of hate and rage and shame was not melting yet, I was still meditating every day and I would get guidance from God or higher power. And the guidance I got, I started to get desperate enough to be willing to admit to all the people I was good at impressing in AA I'm having a hard time. Like, I, I know you want me to speak at your meeting, but I'm all fucked up over here. I started to fi- talk about it just a little, and I started to just a little bit admit that things were not peachy keen, even though I had time and I had done the steps. And so I started to pray about it as well, and I heard very clearly in meditation, you got to work a real six and seven. Like, legit style you got to understand, Katie, is it up here, what six and seven really is? Well, you guys know what the fuck six and seven is. You know, we're entirely ready, right? Admit it, uh, help, help, humble, humbly ask him to remove our shortcomings. Because for me, at that time, I didn't have an actual experience of, ow, I'm in judgment of others, that hurts my heart, Help me, God, and then I felt different after the prayer. I didn't have any kind of thing where I would actually feel different after the prayer. And I would come to meetings, and there'd be always be these little women, these little pretty women, and they were all thin and pretty and shining. And they would come in the meetings and be like, "Yeah, I just had this great session with my higher power," <laughs> and I just felt like all this light just descend on me. And I'm just like, "I forgive you, Mom. I forgive you." And I would be like, fuck you. I do not have that experience. But I have to, t- and my first response was to be like, those people are different. There's AA people. We can do that those people are different in here real good. We're good at it, right? Anywhere. Your neighbor, you and me, your sponsor, your best friend, your kid, whatever. We, that's what, we're good at that. So I decided there was a group of people in AA who could have real God things, but I wasn't one of them. That was my defensive reaction. But behind that, I knew better. Behind it, in the back of my heart, in my soul, I knew it was that I hadn't learned how yet. But I hate, I got a big ego. I hate not knowing anything. So I wanted to already know how to be with God. And, and once I figured out, and let me reframe that, once it was told to me quite clearly in meditation, you have a problem with pride and ego, and you need a thing where you actually pray, and it's actually different after that, You need that, or you're fucked. You're going to fuck that guy, and you're going to smoke a bunch of dope if you don't get six and seven for real. So um, I have a whole story that you can come see a show about that tells you about how I got six and seven, and I went to a healing school, and it was a three-year fucking thing, and I'm now a spiritual healer, and I work privately with people, and my whole life really is about giving people, introducing people to a deeper connection with the divine. That's my whole aim now because it was such a profound shift for me. Um, but the point being, whatever that is for you, whatever, whatever form that needs to take for you, I, my prayer is that you'll find something that is actual. And probably most of you have. I definitely noticed that like, it seemed to be the case at that stage of my recovery, a lot of people had found a thing where you, your heart was tight because you were in judgment or anger or rage or shame, and you would go, oh, higher power, make it better, and it would. And so, if, But if you don't have that yet, and you're like I was at that moment, it's possible. It's not just possible, it's necessary, and it's real for us. It happens. It's totally, totally real, and it can happen for everybody in every room, everywhere in the world. There's nothing special about me or you or this woman or that guy. God is here, right here for all of us. You just have to learn how to access it. 
And there is a way for everyone. And my way is not necessarily your way. There's a million ways, as we know, which is one of the things I love about this program. There's no dictatorial, you've got to do it like this, and you've got to wear this thing on your head. You, you know, you find what you want to wear on your head. I don't care what you wear on your head. I wear what I wear, then sometimes I don't. Sometimes I do, sometimes I fucking don't. Um, so that happened, and I can tell you that ever since that time, my, my experience of sobriety is so fucking different. The, I now understand what the old timers were always talking about, about um, uh, language of the heart. And they would talk about, like, this thing is about love, and this thing is about mercy, and this thing is about compassion. I thought in my first seven years, I thought recovery was about do it fucking hard. You do it hard, you work it hard, you shut the fuck up, you get sober. (laughs) You know, you work this program. (laughs) Which which is how a lot of us have to do it in the beginning, because that's all we know. We don't know from love and compassion and mercy. We like, we come in here and we hear those words, we start to act all love and compassion and mercy y, but we're like little fucking love robots. We don't know what the fuck we're doing. But to actually, the point, the point is to actually have your heart soften and expand and open and to have an actual relationship with the divine that you get in here for real. So once that happened for me, everything changed. Um, the toxic dudes were just unattractive all of a sudden. They just were not interesting. Um, my career stuff has really shifted. Um, I've always done these solo shows. Uh, it's, it's now that I do the spiritual healing work, I'm sort of, div- I sort of live in two worlds. I do this really esoteric, deep healing stuff with people and I do psychic readings and it's very out there and beautiful and weird. And then I write these comedy shows because my lower self needs an outlet as well. And so I get to make fun of myself in that other world and make fun of whatever. And, but I do it all, you know, really with the intention of, of bringing light and bringing levity and bringing joy to, to the world because uh, what I know now is that my whole makeup, my, who I am, is, is all God. It's just God. Any gifts I have that I bring, they're just, they've been given to me. They have nothing to do with my ego and my sense of self. It's sort of funny to think that. I used to take credit for things, and we just can't. Because here's how I know we can't take credit for anything. I did not decide as a kid to be a psychic channel for the divine who does weird solo shows. That's fucking, what is that? Society doesn't go, you know, when you're in sixth grade, you know, kids, you want to look at, you want to be lawyer, doctor, psychic solo show person. No, there's not, that's not even on the fucking radar. That's not an option. There's no checkbox for that on the career wheel. It's not a thing. And yet I can't help but do it. And every time I try to go away from doing my weirdo shit that I do, I no money, money doesn't come. It doesn't work. I don't get hired for normal jobs. They won't hire me for them. It's just, but then if I do this other shit, it, the whole world opens. And I, not only does the world open, but my heart relaxes. I'm at ease. I'm at peace. I'm in the right place. You know what I mean? And that's, that's all I ever wanted. I just wanted to feel at ease in my skin, feel like I was in the right place. And when I, when I listen to what I call God and my higher power and I let it guide my moment-to-moment experience of my life, I'm at ease, I'm at peace, I'm in the right place. So I hope that's been valuable in some way. Thank you so much for having me, you guys. Oh, uh, postcards on the table. Uh, grab one. Thank you so much. Have a good night. Thanks for listening. Please support the channel by liking and subscribing.